Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. I love shapes with lots of curves, like this cradle I built a few years ago, and nothing provides smooth, flawless curves, like a router turning on a circle jig. I've made many temporary jigs in the past, often by just driving a small nail or a screw through a piece of plywood or clamping the router to some scraps, but I have a couple of projects now that demand high accuracy and precise adjustability, so I decided to take the time to make a better and more versatile device. The router I wanted to use has a plunge base with holes for 8mm or 5 16 inch rods. This is a great feature that many routers share, and it makes possible jigs that are strong, easily adjustable, and importantly, that don't sacrifice any of the plunge depth. You can buy rods of this size at just about any hardware store. The jig concept is simple. Drill holes that will slide smoothly on the rods. Then drill a hole perpendicular to the rod. Install a threaded insert into the hole. It's a metal tube with extra deep threads to penetrate into the wood and normal machine screw threads inside. Turn a screw down through the inset to lock the jig in position. This is what a threaded insert looks like. If you buy them online, they're cheap and they're extremely useful. I'm going to make two jigs to ride on these rods. The first, which is ultra simple, will be used on a project where I will already have a pivot hole drilled in the workpiece that will form a solid center for the router jig. The second is a little more complicated. It's a jig that will cut circles and arcs without leaving any centering hole or dimple in the surface of the work. First, I need to establish the exact spacing of the holes in my router base. Lock the rods in place and measure the outside span accurately. Then subtract the thickness of one rod, which is 8 millimeters, to find the distance between centers. For the height above the work surface, measure to the top of one rod and subtract half of the thickness of the rod. These center measurements turned out to be 84 millimeters wide and 10 millimeters high for this DeWalt 611. I bought a 36 inch length of rod and cut it in half, giving me two pieces, each about 45 centimeters long. I needed an extra inch or three centimeters, so I glued two pieces of hardwood together to gain a little extra length. If I need yet more length, I guess I'll just have to buy longer rods, but they're not very expensive. Mine cost a total of about $5. Next, I marked the two holes for the rod with my calipers and drilled them. Take your time to locate the drill bit as accurately as you can. The jig is clamped to the rods with thumb screws mounted in the threaded inserts. I drilled slightly tapered holes for the threaded inserts by first using a bit that matched the size of the nose of the insert and then widening the hole slightly for the base. I like to use my drill press as a jig for keeping the inset perpendicular. In my experience, these have a tendency to go in at an angle if you turn them in freehand. Cut a short piece of threaded rod and jam two nuts on it to create a driver for the insert. I turn the drill chuck by hand. You can drive these into softwood using the drill motor, but in hardwood it seems to me they're better done manually. Once they're about halfway in, you can finish turning them with a wrench, which is easier and more convenient. In my next video project, the center pivot hole will also turn on an 8mm bolt, so I will drill that now. However, you can see that there's plenty of room to drill for other smaller pivot holes as you need them. That's all there is to it for this ultra simple version. Clean up the edges and round over the sharp corners and you're done. Next, let's do a little more complicated jig. There are two parts to this jig. The larger body, which slides on the rods, and a smaller revolving base. I cut out the components for the second jig from some scraps of maple that were 20 millimeters thick or a little over three quarters of an inch. For the body, I glued two small blocks to a larger piece that measured five by three inches. While the glue was curing, I cut out a circular base that was seven centimeters in diameter or two and three quarters inches from the same stock.
When the glue was cured, I drilled holes for the rods just as before. The centers are 84 millimeters apart, but instead of locating them 10 millimeters from the bottom, I moved them down 2 millimeters to a center 8 millimeters above the bottom edge. This is to accommodate a spacer, which you'll see when we assemble the whole jig. The adjustment screws require threaded inserts, installed just as before. Very hard wood, like maple, requires slightly larger pilot holes than soft wood. I recommend that you install one in a piece of scrap first to get the drill sizes exactly right. An Allen wrench allows you to set the inserts below the surface. Dry fit the two pieces of wood together to see approximately where the round base needs to be located so it can turn freely. Both the body and the base need a pilot hole. I drilled the pilot hole in the body about six millimeters or a quarter of an inch down from the exact center of the piece. The pilot hole in the base is at its exact center. Next, we need to drill the body for two bearings and an axle. This is how it looks schematically. It starts with a very thin pilot hole. Drill two holes sized to fit common skate bearings. Then we enlarge the central hole to a half inch or 13 millimeters and insert the bearings. In the round base, Create a recess in the bottom to accommodate a nut and a washer, and then drill an 8 mm central hole. A threaded rod forms an axle on which the upper piece rotates. Epoxy this whole axle assembly in place into the base. Here's how it looks in real wood. Skate bearings are typically 22 mm in diameter. I did not have a 22 millimeter Forstner bit, so I used a 7 eighths inch bit, which is only about a quarter of a millimeter oversize. We will fix this small error in a minute. I used a half inch Forstner bit for the central hole. A 13 millimeter or 14 millimeter bit would also work well. The purpose of this large bore is to allow the central hub of the bearings to rotate freely. I spent a few minutes shaping the body on my scroll saw. This is entirely cosmetic and optional. Removing the concave arc on the front side allows the jig to get closer to the router base for turning small circles. Next, I bored holes in the round base. The large Forstner recess just needs to be deep enough to accommodate a nut and washer. I drilled the central hole slightly smaller than 8 millimeters or 5 16 so it would be a very snug fit on my threaded rod, which is often slightly undersized. I then sanded the hole until it fit perfectly. This only takes a few seconds. Mix some five minute epoxy and set the threaded rod, the washer, and the nut firmly in place. Check that the threaded rod is perfectly perpendicular. Let the epoxy cure for an hour or more. When I drop the skate bearings into the recesses in the top piece, you can easily see the play caused by the oversized holes. An easy way to remove this play and still keep the bearings centered is to make shims from an aluminum can. The aluminum is about 0.12 millimeters thick, so a shim around the whole circumference of the bearing will increase its diameter by almost a quarter of a millimeter, which is almost exactly the discrepancy between 7 8 inch and 22 millimeters.
Now we can assemble the jig. One or two nylon washers sit between the two pieces of the jig for clearance. This spacer is the reason we located the rod holes two millimeters lower in the body. The nut on the top just serves to hold the jig together. Don't over tighten it. In order to locate the jig at the center mark on your workpiece, we need to extend crosshair marks out to the edges of the wheel. Align these marks with the centering lines on your workpiece. To use this jig, apply a piece of double-sided carpet tape to the bottom of the wheel. The work surface needs to be smooth, clean, and free of sawdust. Press the jig down firmly for several seconds to adhere the tape. In use, this jig is buttery smooth and highly accurate. If you go back and forth in the same cut, you can't detect any wobble or variation in the kerf. You should be able to handle a very wide range of curved jobs, either by cutting directly with this jig or by using this jig to produce patterns, which can include several arcs in different directions. You can follow the pattern with a pattern routing bit, which looks like this, but which comes in a variety of sizes and styles. Perfect curves every time. That's it for today, but stay tuned for my next video project, which will be an inexpensive shop-made device for cutting very high accuracy angles on your table saw. If you like this video, hit the like button. And if you want to see more, click on my picture above to subscribe. Thanks for watching.